here at 7.30 on Monday, and uh, that takes us through to next weekend, uh, Saturday the 10th of September at 6 p.m., the divisional welcome meeting uh, in this hall, and uh, our own singing company are on duty for that event. Uh, so please come and support uh, the new officers of the, div the division uh, as they celebrate here next Saturday at 6 o'clock. And our Sunday worship at 10.30 uh, again second Sunday celebrations. Uh, just one thing to highlight uh, in the future is Sunday the 18th, there's two things actually, Sunday the 18th of September is our family fun day down in Grenfell Park, an opportunity uh, to go into the community, uh, koinonia, that sense of community, that sense of God's presence uh, as we go out into the park to meet and to share as a church with the community there. I'm quite excited about Grenfell Park, and I hope you are as well. It's, uh, it's just going and being ourselves uh, and uh, just meeting the community and sharing that time with them. Uh, so join in the excitement as we share on our Family Fun Day on the 18th of September, and that's between 11.30 and 3.30. And 30th of September, Friday the 30th of September, is our monthly uh, charity pop-up shop. And there's also a Macmillan coffee morning uh, that morning. Uh, Margaret Parkhouse is looking for help with that. And she's also looking for cakes and any finance you can uh, support her with as well on, on that event. So uh, if you're around on Friday the 30th of September, why not come along and uh, share in our hub for the Macmillan coffee morning and the charity shop. We look forward to worship, and hopefully the, the technical issues, he's smiling at the back, so that means everything's good. So let's share together in worship. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's good to see you all again. It seems like ages since we were here, but uh, it's good to be back and good to be amongst you. We've had a great time in North Norfolk and feeling relaxed and refreshed. Thank you to everybody who stood in and done things over the last... Um, couple of weeks, those who have looked after <laughs> Andrew and I are second guessing each other at the moment. I'm going to turn the lapel mic off and turn this one back on. There we go. That saves using two mics. So yes, thank you to those who have looked after things over the last couple of weeks. Thank you to Major Maureen and to David and Antoinette who looked after our meetings, our worship in the last couple of weeks, and to Rob and Mike and Liz and others who've looked after admin things as well. And uh, it is good to be back. We're thinking about dealing with discouragement today. So I thought we would encourage at least one person to start with. Um, I don't want to set a trend, but it's Pam's birthday today. So I think we should sing happy birthday to Pam, don't you? Let's do that then. And Pam tells me that she's 21 today, and uh, I know that a soldier would never lie to me, so that must be true. 21 plus VAT, maybe. Uh, but I uh, hope you have a great birthday today, Pam, uh, worshipping with us and everything else that's going to happen today. One of the other ways that we can encourage each other and encourage ourselves is to praise God, and that's what we're going to do in our first song, 403 in the songbook. If you're using the songbook, we're going to use verses 1, 3, and 5. When morning gilds the skies, my heart awaking cries, may Jesus Christ be praised. Just have a think for a moment. When you woke this morning, when the alarm went off, or when the sun started to come through your window and you kind of, you came to just after dawn, did you say, may Jesus Christ be praised? Or did you say something else? Don't, don't, whatever you do, tell me what the other thing was. Hopefully you said, may Jesus Christ be praised. Alive at work and prayer, to Jesus I repair, may Jesus Christ be praised. Let's stand and we'll sing one, three and five.
Amen. Stay standing if you're able to, because we're going to sing another song, this time a love song to God, saying, beautiful one, I love you, beautiful one, I adore. Wonderful phrases in this song uh, that enables us to praise God, to show our love to God, to give our love back to God, and to encourage ourselves and to encourage each other as we do so. So let's sing together, beautiful one.
Okay, you can take your seats if you'd like to. Um, just as I draw your attention to the words that we sang in our first song in the third verse, which says, Does sadness fill my mind? A solace here I find. May Jesus Christ be praised. Or fades my earthly bliss. My comfort still is this. May Jesus Christ be praised. Even when we feel sad, even when we feel discouraged, we can still encourage ourselves. We can still encourage each other by praising Jesus. And uh, that's what we're going to remember in our next song, which is Blessed Be Your Name, which says, it doesn't matter whether the sun is shining or the rain has come, I'm going to choose to bless the name of God and in that way find encouragement for myself and for others. So let's sing together, Blessed Be Your Name. name don't we and we continue continue to do that now as we listen to the sing company and their worship for this morning
Go and do something beautiful. Go and do something that Jesus would as you leave here today. Now, it's a lot easier to do that, I think, if you've been encouraged whilst you've been here. Uh, then it makes you want to go out and do something beautiful uh, for somebody. I wonder if somebody would like to come and help me build some blocks. Who's a good block builder? Yeah? You're going to come and build some... You're, you're too shy, haven't you? You haven't met me yet. <laughs> let, let alone building blocks with me. Somebody else going to come and build blocks with me? Anyone? Somebody? If not, I'll be, build my own. Come on then, John T. You can help me. All right. You build them however you want. No, I, I, I'm not. I suck at free building. Okay. So I, don't, I don't like building. You don't like building. Okay. Well, I was going to ask you how you feel about building, so I guess that answers that question. What about other people? Anybody enjoy building blocks or doing building work? Anybody? anybody? Yeah? Yeah? Excellent. You like Lego? Yeah? Okay, uh, houses, yeah. building your own houses, yeah, okay, that's good. Yeah, it doesn't have to be just Lego, it could be any kind of uh, bricks. And um, it's good, it's good to be able to build stuff, it's good to be able to create stuff. Now what about, you're not getting very far there, John T. I was expecting something a bit taller than that by now. What, happen, what about how you feel when somebody comes along and knocks your building down? I was going to knock Jonty's building down, but he's only, he's only on row one at the moment. There we go. Look at that. There you go. So what happens when I knock it down? How do you feel now? It's, it's still together. It's still together. That's all right. What if I break it up then? Now, now how do you feel? A bit disappointed. Okay. Anybody else feel disappointed or discouraged if somebody comes along and knocks their building down? How about the Lego fiends? Yeah, absolutely. Sandcastles. Yeah, yeah. Or if your dog... Anyway, we won't worry about what the dog was doing to sandcastles last week. Uh, it can be discouraging, can't it? And that's the opposite to what Paul wants us to do as Christians. In... Um, one of his letters, he invites us to encourage one another and to build each other up. I wonder what that means. I mean, it's easy. We know what it means as far as buildings are concerned, aren't we? This is building a building up. What's it mean to build each other up? How would you build somebody up, John T? Um, compliment them. Compliment them, yes. Yeah. So you could see something good they were doing and compliment them or just say they look nice today or... You know, they look smart in their uniform or whatever. What else? Anyone else in the congregation still awake out there? How else can we build each other up? Guidance. Guidance, yeah. So we might give some people a word of advice if, if they ask for it. Sometimes it can be discouraging if you could give advice that hasn't been asked for. But yeah, sometimes we seek each other's wisdom, don't we? How else? Encouraging, yep, yeah, just to be encouraging about something or to thank someone for doing something nice for us. So when we go and grab our coffees and our teas and our biscuits afterwards, we could say thank you to Maureen, couldn't we? And that would encourage you, wouldn't Maureen? Yeah, she's more likely to pour you a coffee next week if you say thank you this week. Um, and we can, we can point out somebody's talents and uh, thank them for using those. And all of those. So we're not supposed to knock each other down as Christians. We're asked to build each other up and to encourage each other. And when we're encouraged, we can then go and do a great work for God. We can go and do something beautiful. Go and do something that Jesus would because we've received this encouragement. So I wonder if you can all think of one bit of encouragement that you could give to someone this week and somebody that you could give encouragement to. And then my challenge is for you to go and give that encouragement to someone. Have you thought of someone, John T? Somebody you can encourage? Seconds. Not in this 10 seconds. Okay, I'll give you a little bit longer then. And, um, but see if you can encourage someone this week. Give John T a hand for helping me out this morning. Thank you, John T. I'm going to mention the fruit of the Spirit a little bit later in our meeting, so I thought we probably needed a reminder of what the fruit of the Spirit are. Can you remember? I can tell you what's not a fruit of the Spirit. 
A banana is not a fruit of the spirit. A melon is not a fruit of the spirit. What, what else is not a fruit of the spirit? Gail. No, I can't remember either. I think the best thing to do is for us to join in the song. Okay, this song reminds us what is not a fruit of the spirit and what is a fruit of the spirit. If you want to stand, you can stand as we learn this song together. not a coconut fruit of the spirit's not a coconut if you want to be a coconut you might as well hear it you can't be a fruit of the spirit cause the fruit is love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness and gentleness and self-control love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness and gentleness and self-control oh the fruit of the spirit's not a banana the fruit of the spirit's not a banana you wanna be a banana? You might as well hear it. You can't be a fruit of the spirit, cause the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Oh, the fruit of the spirit's not a watermelon. The fruit of the spirit's not a watermelon. You wanna be a watermelon? You might as well hear it. You can't be a fruit of the spirit, cause the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Oh, the fruit of the spirit's not a lemon. The fruit of the spirit's not a lemon. If you wanna be a lemon, you might as well hear it. You can't be a fruit of the spirit, cause the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Oh, the fruit of the spirit's not a cherry. The fruit of the spirit's not a cherry. If you want to be a cherry, you might as well hear it. You can't be a fruit of the spirit, cause the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control. Okay, everybody knows that grapes come in bunches, so everybody get in big bunches. The fruit of the spirit's not a grape. The fruit of the spirit's not a grape. You want to be a grape. You might as well hear it, you can't be a fruit of the spirit Cause the fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control The fruit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, and gentleness, and self-control
Hopefully the songsters have got their breath back after the fruit of the spirit because they're going to bring their message to us at this time. And then the Lazenbury family are going to lead us in our prayer time this morning before John brings us our Bible reading from Nehemiah chapter 4.
Shall we pray? Let us come before the Lord now. Let us come before the Lord now in stillness. The Lord has weird words for the weary, encouragement for those who struggle, and comfort for our souls. Let us gather as disciples, awaiting the Lord, our leader. Amen. Recall and name people whose witness, kindness, and encouragement. Recall and name people whose witness, kindness, and encouragement have been a bridge between heaven and earth for you. Those who have made the love of God feel more real. Dear God, thank you for those who have shown me your love, affirmed me where I have doubted, and drawn me into your kingdom. Amen. Now a prayer for encouragement. Living God, sometimes we simply don't know which way to turn. Living God, sometimes we simply don't know which way to turn until it dawns on us that the only way forward is back. Back to your truth, your way, your word. We want to move on, put the past behind us, sweep the dirt under the carpet, paper over the cracks, <coughs> until it dawns on us that the only way forward is back, <clears throat> back to your truth, your way, your word. Merciful God, you are always seeking to save us from ourselves by your truth, your way, your word made flesh in Christ, the hard truth, the hard way, exposed on the hard wood of the cross. No getting around it, no cop out, just paying the price for what we seek to paper over and sweep under the rug, to bury, to run away from, to deny. Repent, you say. Turn back. It is the only way forward. Back to my truth, my way, my word. God of all reconciliation, by the power of your Holy Spirit, dawn upon us. So move and encourage us by your truth, your way, and your living word, that we might speak your truth in love, live your way with confidence and compassion, be guided and guide one another with your word of life. Gathered in his name and united in his love, we ask this through Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Amen. Reading is from Nehemiah chapter 4. Nehemiah chapter 4. When Sanballat heard that we were rebuilding the wall, he became angry and was greatly incensed. He ridiculed the Jews, and in the presence of his associates and the army of Samaria, he said, What are those feeble Jews doing? Will they restore their wall? Will they offer sacrifices? Will they finish in a day? Can they bring the stones back to life from those heaps of rubble, burned as they are? Tobiah the Ammonite, who was at his side, said, What are they building? If even a fox climbed up on it, he would break down their wall of stones. Hear us, O God, for we are despised. Turn their insults back on their own heads. Give them over as plunder in a land of captivity. Do not cover up their guilt or blot out their sins from your sight, for they have thrown insults in the face of the builders. So we rebuilt the wall till all of it reached half its height, for the people worked with all their heart. And when Sanballat, Tobiah, the Arabs, the Ammonites, and the men of Ashdod heard that the repairs to Jerusalem's wall had gone ahead and that the gaps were being closed, they were very angry. They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. But we prayed to our God and posted a guard day and night to meet this threat. Meanwhile, the people in Judah said, The strength of the laborers is giving out and there is so much rubble that we cannot rebuild the wall. Also, our enemies said, Before they know it or see us, we will be right there among them and will kill them and 
put an end to their work. Then the Jews who lived near them came and told us ten times over, wherever you turn, they will attack us. Therefore, I stationed some of the people behind the lowest points of the wall at the exposed places, posting them by families with their swords, spears and bows. After I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who is great and awesome and fights for your brothers, your sons and your daughters, your wives and your homes. When our enemies heard that we were aware of their plot and that God had frustrated it, we all returned to the wall, each to his own work. Amen. If you've got your Bible or your Bible app open, then I invite you to uh, keep it open and uh, let's just pray together. (coughs) Father God, will you just come to us, make us aware of your presence as we open your word this morning? Will you speak to us? Will you encourage us? Will you help us to be encouragers of each other through your word? And may we, because we have done, because we have been encouraged today, go and do something beautiful for you this week in the day and the days to come. Amen. Amen. Now I don't want to worry you, but I want to tell you about a plague which is going through Christians and some of our churches. You'll be glad to know it's not coronavirus. It's not even monkey flu. It's not bird flu. It's not swine flu. It's probably something that you may not have heard of before. It's called the Eeyore syndrome. Ever come across anybody who's been infected with the Eeyore syndrome? I'm sure there is nobody here who has the Eeyore syndrome, but you may be able to think of someone. You may even be able to think of a Christian who goes around like Eeyore from Winnie the Pooh. They're the kind of person who looks on the gloomy side of life. Everyone and everything is against them. The decisions that the leaders make are there simply to wind them up. Excuse me a minute. (coughs) this is what happens when you haven't spoken publicly for a fortnight they're the ones you hear saying things aren't what they used to be (laughs) things aren't being done in the right way when somebody says to you things aren't being done in the right way what they really mean is people aren't doing them the way that I'd do them they look at the floor Their faces often look like a wet weekend in Yarmouth. Now, if Yarmouth is one of your favourite places to go to, I apologise. There are some beautiful parts of Norfolk, but Great Yarmouth is not one of them. Even a dry weekend in Yarmouth doesn't look that great. A wet weekend in Yarmouth is even worse. The only thing they get enthusiastic about is telling you how bad things are. That's how you know if somebody has been infected with the Eeyore syndrome. Now, we've been reminded this morning that a banana and a watermelon and a coconut and a grape and all of those other fruits that you tried to get through isn't one of the fruit of the spirits. Well, the Eeyore syndrome is not a fruit of the spirit either. Let's remind ourselves what Paul tells us the fruit of the spirit is. Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 and 23. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these things. Do you see what's missing in that list? Not just coconuts, grapes, and lemons, but complaining and always looking on the gloomy side of life. That's not in the list. Did you know that? So, If we are growing the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, then that's a vaccination against the Eeyore syndrome. Because if you're growing the fruit of the Spirit in your life, if you're growing love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control, then those things are what control your life, not the Eeyore syndrome. 
It's very easy, I think, for some of us, and I would count myself in this, to be discouraged, to become discouraged. What do we mean by discouraged? Well, here's a definition from William Ward, who's a Christian writer, and I thought it was quite helpful. It says this. Discouragement is dissatisfaction with the past, distaste for the present, and distrust of the future. That covers everything. It is ingratitude for the blessings of yesterday, indifference to the opportunities to today, and insecurity regarding strength for tomorrow. That covers everything as well. It's unawareness of the presence of beauty, unconcern for the needs of our fellow man, and unbelief in the promises of old. It is impatience with time, immaturity of thought, and impoliteness <coughs> to God. That's how bad discouragement is. <coughs> when we're discouraged, or when we discourage other people, then that's what we bring into their lives. So over the next few minutes, we're just going to have a look at the way that Nehemiah deals with discouragement in Nehemiah chapter 4. Now it's been a couple of weeks, in fact it's been three weeks since I pre preached on Nehemiah because the Sunday before I went away it was second Sunday. So just to remind you of the story, God has made Nehemiah aware of the state of Jerusalem's walls which are in disrepair and the city's parlous state because it's left undefended. And so Nehemiah approaches the king and asks for permission to rebuild the walls. And miraculously, the king says, yes, he can do that. Having said to another group years before that they were not able to do it. And so he travels to Jerusalem and he inspects the walls and then he recruits the city and other people to help rebuild the walls. If you look back in Nehemiah chapter 3, the chapter before we just read, then you can see that the walls have begun to be rebuilt. Then we get to chapter 4. In chapter 4, there is a response to the fact that the people of Judah are rebuilding the city's walls. In verses 7 and 8, we read, When Sambalat and Tobiah and the Arabs, Ammonites and Ashdodites heard that the work was going ahead and that the gaps in the wall of Jerusalem were being repaired, they were furious. They all made plans to come and fight against Jerusalem and throw us into confusion. So what was the people of God's response to the fact that their enemies were so furious about the fact that they were rebuilding the walls? Did they go, that's okay, we're just going to carry on anyway? No, they were infected by the Eeyore syndrome. Verse 10 says, the people of Judah began to complain, the workers are getting tired and there is much rubble to be moved, we'll never be able to build the wall by ourselves. They threw a pity party for themselves, we're never going to be able to do this, it's not worth the effort, we're tired, there's so much to be done. And to be fair, I guess it's not a surprise that the people of Judah were discouraged because they did face many enemies. In fact, as you read through Nehemiah to this point, it seems like their enemies are getting bigger and bigger and bigger and more and more of them. So we had Sambalat and his sidekick Tobiah to start with. Then along comes a mysterious Arab called Geshem, who we know nothing about apart from his name. Then we had the Ammonites and the Ashdodites. And Jerusalem is surrounded by enemies from Samaria, Ashdod, Edom, and Ammon. It's being pressurized by all of its neighbors. And all of them have political reasons for cutting Israel down to size and ensuring that it doesn't become too confident and self-sufficient to ensure that it, its city remains undefended. So it's no wonder, I guess, that the people of God were feeling discouraged. But if that wasn't bad enough, if it wasn't enough that they'd angered their enemies by starting to rebuild the wall, the enemies go one step further and start to, to ridicule them. They start laughing at what they're doing. If you look at verse 2, it says uh, that they were saying in front of their friends and the Sumerian army officers, what do these bunch of poor, feeble Jews think they're doing? Do they think they can build the wall in a single day by just offering a few sacrifices? Do they actually think they can make something from stones, uh, of stones from a rubbish heap and charred ones at that? They were mocking him. They said, you're never going to be able to manage to do this. Sam Ballot and his friends looked at them and their human resources 
and called them feeble. They attacked the work that they were doing. They denied that God could help them to rebuild the walls. And he didn't believe that the Jews' sacrifices, their equivalent of of prayer and worship to God as we would do today, would help them achieve the future that they wanted to build. He scoffed to think that they would even finish the project and that if they did, then the walls would soon be in ruin again. It's no wonder they were discouraged, really. But they were also discouraged because they were surrounded by rubbish. They say in verse 10, there is so much rubble to be moved. They were surrounded by rubbish. And it was getting in the way of the rebuilding. Now, you will probably be glad to learn as you get to know me that I don't really do any building work. If I did rebuild, if I did building work, it would probably end in rubble fairly quickly. But sometimes I do get to bake. Not quite the same thing. Slightly less masculine, perhaps. But um, Gail will tell you after the meeting, if you ask her, she's probably nodding her head any minute now, that after about 15, or minute, 15 minutes or so in the kitchen, uh, the place usually looks like a bombsite. Surrounded by rubble or at least the baking equivalent of rubble. And sometimes I have to kind of clear up around me before I can carry on with the baking. Sometimes the best thing that we can, that, that we can do when we're discouraged by the rubbish and the rubble in our lives is simply to clear it out. It's no wonder that the people of God were discouraged. So the first thing that we can take away from Nehemiah chapter 4 is that we shouldn't be discouraged if we feel discouraged. Is that okay? We shouldn't feel discouraged if we feel discouraged. Some of you are scratching your head and going, where are you going with this, Rob? What I mean is that feeling discouraged isn't a weakness. That's not what Nehemiah chapter 4 is saying. Don't ever feel that you must be weak and feeble and a bad Christian if you ever suffer from discouragement. Even the best Christians can feel discouraged at times. One of the greatest preachers of all time, C.H. Spurgeon, sometimes gave in to discouragement. He once said, I would not wish upon my worst enemy the depths of despair and discouragement I often feel for weeks or months at a time. And he's a Christian hero. Everyone feels discouraged at times. Judah, the people of Judah, were the chief tribe in Israel. The the tribe of Judah were the leaders of the nation. And yet they were the ones who told Nehemiah that they couldn't continue, that they were discouraged. It's not a weakness to feel discouraged. You shouldn't feel discouraged because you feel discouraged. Even if you're suffering from Eeyore syndrome, you shouldn't necessarily see that a weakness. As long as you don't stay that way. You're not a bad Christian if you get discouraged. But you are a bad Christian, and by that I mean you're a bad reflection of God, if you choose to stay that way. If you choose to wallow in Eeyore syndrome then you have a problem because you're not growing the fruit of spirit, the spirit in your lives. But if you remember that God is on your side, if you remember that he is there to stretch you as you grow in spiritual maturity, if you remember that his spirit is there to grow the fruit of the spirit in your lives, if you recall that he's there to help you grow through any discouraging circumstances you might find yourselves in, then you'll begin to have a positive impact on God's future for you and for his people. And this is important not just for you, it's important for the people around you. Now this always makes me sit up and take notice whenever I use this quote. But Jim Rohn, who's an American businessman and motivational speaker, says, you are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. Just think about that for a moment. 
You are the average of the five people you spend the most time with. That means if you spend most of your time with negative people, with people who are suffering from Eeyore syndrome, then eventually you find yourself suffering from Eeyore syndrome. You find your, your, yourself becoming negative. Conversely, if you find yourself ever feeling discouraged or suffering from the Eeyore syndrome, then the best thing you can do is to find cheerful people and positive people to hang around because it rubs off on you. Anybody know someone whose smile just makes them feel better? Any, oh dear. Some, <laughs> some of you need to find some people that are positive in your lives. Okay, some of you are still counting up the five people that you spend most of the time with. Okay, find someone whose smile just lights up the room and you'll begin to feel encouraged. You'll begin to feel more cheerful. That's one practical thing that we can do. Another practical thing that we can do is to do what Nehemiah did. What did Nehemiah do in the face of all this discouragement and the fact that his people had caught Eeyore syndrome? He prayed. Verses 4 and 5 say, Hear us, our God, for we are being mocked. May their scoffing fall back on their own heads, and may they themselves become captives in a foreign land. Do not ignore their guilt, do not blot out their sins, for they have provoked you to anger here in front of the builders. Nehemiah prayed. He turned to God. He left control of those things in God's hands. He turned the discouragers over to God and said, will you deal with them? Then he moved on from that and he chose to be an encourager. I think there are too many discouragers in the world. I know there are none here, so you won't have met any here, but you may have met them somewhere else. Maidenhead Citadel needs encouragers. We need encouragers. God's future needs us each to be half glass full Christians, not half glass empty, or even, I haven't even got a glass Christians. Nehemiah sees that God's people are discouraged and in danger of simply giving up on the future God has planned for them. And so this is what he says. As I looked over the situation, I called together the nobles and the rest of the people and I encouraged them. I said to them, don't be afraid of the enemy. Remember the Lord who is great and glorious and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives and your homes. Nehemiah reminds them who God is, reminds them of the job that they're there to do on God's behalf and says, let's get on and do it. And because of his encouragement, that's exactly what they decide to do. So will we throw off discouragement this morning? Anybody ready to do that? Yeah? Good. Will we rid ourselves of any trace of the Eeyore syndrome? Are we going to submit to the vaccine of the fruit of the Spirit? And grow that in our lives instead. To choose to see the positive rather than the gloomy. To choose joy rather than cheerlessness. When someone asks you, how are you? Will you choose to say something positive? Maybe. <laughs> Not quite sure about that one. Let's choose to be encouraged and to be encouragers. Well, I guess another definition of encourage is to take courage on board. And so that's what we're going to do in our final song. It's not a song that we sing very often these days, but we're going to sing it this morning. Don't blink, because you'll miss it. There's only two verses. It's 488 in the Salvation Army songbook, if you're using a songbook. And it simply says, courage, brother. And sister, if you can fit that in as well, then do that as well. Courage, brother, do not stumble, though thy path be dark as night. There's a star to guide the humble, trust in God and do the right. Let the road be long and dreary and its end far out of sight. Foot it bravely, strong or weary, trust in God and do the right. Trust in God and be encouraged. Let's stand and sing these two verses. <laughs>
Amen. And now our benediction from Romans chapter 15. May the God who gives endurance and encouragement give you a spirit of unity among yourselves as you follow Christ Jesus, so that with one heart and mouth you may glorify the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you this week. <laughs>